All right, I think I'll get the ball rolling now. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Rowan, and I want to welcome you to Audubon Great Lakes, My Birds, and Detroit Zoo's webinar on the Black Crown Night Heron. Uh, thank you for spending the next hour with us. We're really hoping this webinar will be particularly helpful because we know people are spending more time outside and continuing to connect with nature closer to home. The physical and mental health benefits of experiencing nature are so important for everyone, and Audubon and MyBirds are committed to making the outdoors safe and welcoming for all. I'm the Senior Conservation Associate with Audubon Great Lakes, and I manage the MyBirds program, which is an outreach and engagement program presented by Michigan Department of Natural Resources and Audubon Great Lakes which aims to increase all Michiganders' engagement in the understanding, care, and stewardship of public lands that are important for birds and people. Audubon Great Lakes is a regional office of National Audubon. Our focus is on protecting birds and the places they need across the Great Lakes region through advocacy, education, and on-the-ground conservation. We work across the five Great Lakes states where we have over 215,000 members, more than 50 chapters, and two nature centers. I will be your facilitator today with the help of Emily Osborne, our senior communications manager, who will be monitoring the chat box and will help to facilitate the Q&A session at the end of the program. A few housekeeping items before we get started. First off, this presentation is being recorded. All panelists, uh, or all participants, excuse me, will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you're joining us on Zoom, please take a moment to locate the participant and chat function on the Zoom platform to actively participate in the webinar. If you'd like to send a question or comment to the facilitator, please use that chat function. If you're participating via Facebook Live, please submit your question or comment in the comments section. We will be monitoring the chat box throughout this webinar and the comments on Facebook, so please be respectful and appropriate while participating. If you are kind of tired of seeing the chat box in the Zoom platform, feel free to close the chat box by clicking on the chat icon again. Uh, we will be reviewing the questions you've submitted uh, during the Q&A session and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Oh, also, if you wanna test out that chat function, please feel free to introduce yourself uh, and let us know where you're coming from today. Uh, so today we're excited to talk to you about all things Black Crown Night Herons. Uh, we are here to learn about their life history, conservation status and threats, uh, where to find them here in Michigan, and how to identify them at different ages and tell them apart from similar looking species. We're going to learn about a local Southeast Michigan Black Crown Night Heron rookery uh, that you can visit up close and personal. And then we'll also participate in a little bird ID quiz uh, using that chat function again. Uh, we'll end it with some calls to action, how you can help uh, Black Crown Night Herons in your communities, and then a Q&A session where we can address your questions. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Matthew Porter, our guest speaker today and a zookeeper at the Detroit Zoo who specializes in caring for some of our favorite local birds like black crown night herons, as well as some that are farther away from home like penguins. Matthew, take it away. How are you guys doing today? As Aaron said, uh, my name is Matthew Porter and uh, just a little bit on me. I've been working with uh, all kinds of different bird species here at the zoo for, oh, I don't know, maybe 13 or 14 years. And as she said, worked with uh, anything from songbirds to penguins, eagles and cranes to uh, studying these uh, really cool black crown night herons. So just a touch about the zoo. Uh, we are open 362 days a year. If you guys want to come visit, we're only closed on Thanksgiving, Christmas, or New Year's Day. Uh, starting April 1st, we'll just be getting into our spring and summer hours. So we'll, we'll be open from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. And here at the zoo, we want to, uh, we not only want to teach the community about all these unique and um, species from around the world, but we're also looking to be a partner and help in protecting where they live throughout Earth. So we're here celebrating and saving wildlife and wild places. 
So with that, let's uh, get into the uh, natural history of the black crown night heron. So we might as well uh, start at what type of habitat they like. They are a very uh, opportunistic bird and wetland and marsh is provides really good habitat for them along with some other even more different terrestrial habitats. Within uh, wetland and marsh areas, it provides them suitable breeding habitat, but also um, good habitat for foraging. They are accustomed to being in salt and fresh water. So we'll, when we get around into where the ranges are, you'll see that they're in wetlands all over the US, but they also thrive along uh, much of our coast. And then they, they do need some ability of cover for foraging and to be able to be building their nests. All right, so uh, behaviorally, they're mostly crepuscular and uh, nocturnal. Uh, if anybody uh, doesn't know crepuscular, pretty much meaning that you're very active during dawn and dusk. And then nocturnal, well, their name pretty much gives it away. It's not a, not a misnomer here. They are the night herons. And uh, even though uh, they, they like to be active at night, certainly during breeding season, uh, you'll see them a lot more active during the day. As any, anyone uh, participating here knows who has kids, you, uh, you may have to be up uh, around the clock when you're trying to raise them. And that's, that's the same for the night herons. So they're uh, pretty colonial and uh, social. They, they breed in uh, rookeries where they will nest together with a, a big grouping of birds. And uh, their rookeries won't always be just black crown night herons. Sometimes uh, you'll have different species of ibis or egrets or herons mixed in the colonies, depending on where in the US or frankly the world we're talking about that they're breeding. Uh, when, when you're at a, a rookery or if you've ever been to a nesting site, it is a, a quite noisy social place, uh, also very messy. <laughs> but uh, that being said, uh, yeah, the real social, they're going to they're gonna protect their nesting area together from predators, and they're also going to protect their foraging uh, areas. And uh, one note on the sociality. They have a pretty distinct uh, vocalization. It's it's almost just like a qua qua or like a quack noise, and and you'll hear it repeatedly made. So uh, if you get a chance to come visit the colony at the zoo this summer, or maybe a colony near near your home, wherever you may live, certainly uh, enjoy their vocalization. So on on to their breeding. Uh, this picture does a nice job of showing their nests they generally build a platform of sticks. Normally, uh, the male will pick out the site, and a lot of times he does a great deal of the gathering of material while the female will build the nest, but they definitely uh, work as a team to, to work on the nest together. Uh, both parents work to build the nest, they will incubate uh, the eggs together, and it's a uh, it's a team effort and black crown night herons are generally, from what we understand, monogamous, definitely seasonally and, and perhaps year after year too. So more on the breeding, once they get that nest built, it's time to lay some eggs. So usually uh, they'll lay a clutch of uh, maybe three to five eggs. They're, they're pretty good size eggs, similar to the size of like a chicken egg. And uh, they're usually a light bluish green. And that's, it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good size egg for this bird. We'll just talk about the night heron size for a minute while we're, we're at this topic. They're about a two foot long bird weighing in at about two pounds, a pretty stocky build and have about a four foot wingspan. So, so they do produce a pretty good egg. So once they lay the eggs, they'll incubate for eh, just under about four weeks. So 24 to 26 days and then the chicks will hatch. And uh, once they hatch, uh, you have a, a pretty uh, altricial young. They are pretty featherless and completely dependent on the parents to be incubated, kept warm and uh, fed. 
So the parents will work tirelessly around the clock to get enough food for these chicks. And within about a month, maybe maybe six or seven weeks, uh, the chicks will start to uh, leave the nest and fledge. And what we see, at least at a lot of our colony here at the zoo, is you certainly have your share of chicks that get out of the nest a little early, unfortunately. And that's not a good place for these little birds to be on the ground. Uh, but as long as they're pretty close to fledging, either primary feathers hopefully have come in partially, they can get a little lift and they might hop fly. And they also have really good uh, sharp toenails. So they can maybe climb up into a bush and not necessarily get into their nest that could be 30, 40 feet up, but they can get out of harm's way until they can fly good. All right, so their diet. Very, very opportunistic bird. They they eat all kinds of stuff. We have written here lots of fish, insects, amphibians, and reptiles. Beyond that, they they will raid and eat eggs from other birds' nests. I've I've heard about them eating chipmunks. So they have really a varied diet. And they're really smart. They are documented using baiting as a technique where in some areas they will actually do a form of fishing where they might put a little stick or some piece of debris in the environment and they put them in the water and will draw fish to the surface. So they're, yeah, they're really crafty and smart birds and they'll, they'll use that to their ability to make foraging easier. So their, their length of life, ah, uh, they live, um, not not as long as maybe your cranes or your citizens or parrots, but they still have a pretty good lifespan, potentially 15 or 20 years. And from data, the oldest recorded night heron was uh, just over 21 years and five months, which is which is a long lived bird. And I wouldn't be surprised with more banding efforts if we, we you know, we don't find a couple birds that even could live longer than that. All right, so on to their range. Uh, these guys are the most prevalent heron in the world. They are found globally in, an, in the environment where they can thrive, except for Antarctica or Australia. And frankly, in Antarctica, there's plenty of a food source for them, but it's just not enough of a terrestrial environment for them to really go through their life cycle. There's, I think, only three species or so of flowering plant in Antarctica and, and no uh, woody material for them to build a nest. So they, they just wouldn't make it there, not even up on the peninsula. And in Australia, there is a very similar species called the Nankeen night heron that completely uh, uses up their niche and is the dominant species there. And it's a really cool night heron, um, looks very similar to the black crown, but more rufous colored. So feel free to after the webinar, if you, you know, you're still wanting to learn some more on night herons, do a little homework on the Nankeen and, and check out a little bit about that. But I'd, I'd imagine they're genetically very similar and just uh, diverged at some point. Uh, so that's why they're not in Australia. And then as this uh, map shows that they, they uh, are all over the US where there's suitable habitat. The red is kind of showing um, breeding areas. Uh, where they'll breed in the summer. And then the purple, the darker purple is gonna be year round breeding locations, which you see around the coast where they really have a good food source probably year round. And then the lighter purple is gonna be, they're gonna be some year round uh, areas, but not nearly as dense of population. And then the blue is showing some of their winter and migrational uh, areas. And I think the uh, next map, we'll, we'll dive into this a little more. So yes, as we talk about migration of these guys, within the Americas, uh, some of the population is migratory and some of it is not. Um, as you can see, the orange uh, again here is designating breeding territory. And, and a lot of these uh, northern breeders are migratory. You know, they probably come up and use a lot of our marshes and areas within the seasonal forest and optimally get food during the summer months when food is abundant. 
and then they might head back to more southern temperate areas or the tropics in the winter where they can have an easier food source but by heading north they can breed with uh, less competition there and then again the purple is showing a year-round range so I, I love this map because it just shows us beyond the u.s throughout central america and and South America, they've really done a, a fantastic job of of finding the areas and marshes and all the where they need and want to breed. And uh, with that, I think we'll fly over to Erin, and she's gonna talk to you about some of their conservation and the threats to them. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as Matt mentioned, the species of heron is found across the globe, which is, I, I just love birds that are like that, that you can really share with folks from all different places and cultures. Um, but they are globally a species of least concern um, on, on that world scale. Um, but overall, we are seeing some decreasing population trends. Um, and here in the Great Lakes region in particular, uh, we're seeing steeper population declines. Um, so here in Michigan, for example, they're a species of conservation concern, um, as well as in Wisconsin, they're state threatened in Ohio and designated as state endangered in Indiana and Illinois. So while globally they seem to be somewhat stable in our region specifically and here in Michigan, their populations aren't really faring well. well. Um, they are also an Audubon Great Lakes and Michigan State Wildlife Action Plan focal species um, due to these population declines. So they are a priority species for us. Um, so why are these birds seeing population declines like this across the Great Lakes and here in Michigan? Um, some research uh, suggests that these earlier declines back in the 1950s and 60s were due to DDT, um, which similarly had big impacts on our raptor populations like our osprey, bald eagles, and peregrine falcons. Um, DDT was a pesticide that ended up um, thinning eggshells of these birds. So when they were incubating on the nest, they would crack and break their eggs. Um, causing it to be very difficult to, to produce young successfully. Um, habitat destruction also continues to be a real threat and problem for this species, uh, including alteration and degradation. Um, so for black crowned night herons, uh, we talked about how wetlands and marshlands are really important for them. Um, and here in Michigan, we've lost about half of our wetlands due to development and conversion to agriculture. Um, and then across the Great Lakes region, we've lost over half of our wetlands. So uh, that gives us a little bit of information as to why we might be seeing declines here in the region specifically. Uh, because of where black crown night herons fall on the food chain as well, um, Matt had talked about all the different things they like to eat and how opportunistic they are. It actually makes them more vulnerable to things like pesticides and other contaminants um, that can biomagnify in that food chain. So as it goes up the food chain, the amount of contaminants can really greatly increase and cause problems for this species. Um, that also, though, makes them a really great um, bioindicator of habitat quality, which is another reason they're a focal species for us here in the Great Lakes. Uh, black crowned night herons are also vulnerable to changes in climate, um, as Audubon's climate report has shown, and Great Lakes water level changes. Um, so this research suggests that water level changes as well as climate change could impact the accessibility of their food, uh, if water levels are too high for their foraging, for example, um, or if that food source um, becomes available at different times. So insects typically are a really great food source for marsh birds um, when they're young hatch, when they first hatch out of the egg. And if you think about the timing of our big mayfly hatch that typically happens in mid to late June, that usually aligns with kind of peak hatching dates of these secretive marsh birds. And climate change um, and contaminants could impact the quality of that hatch and when that hatch occurs, which could impact hatchling success. Um, and overall fledging success for this species and other secretive marsh birds. 
So some conservation strategies, um, what we can do to help black crown night herons here in the region um, is to protect coastal marshes from development, um, Great Lakes coastal marshes, but also inland marshes, um, as well as conversion to agriculture. And then conserving the remaining wetlands we have, um, the natural diversity within those. So there are a couple of invasive species. We talked about degradation of habitat. Um, one of the things that degrades habitat is the presence of invasive species like Phragmites, which is a, a cattail, kind of cattail or reed. Um, and then we also have hybridized cattail. And what these species do is take over a, a marsh like this one photograph. This is a sedge tussock, healthy wetland. Um, up at Wigwam Bay State Wildlife Area, but if hybridized cattail gets in here, it would take over and outcompete the sedge tussock that we see here and form a big monoculture, this one giant dense stand of cattail. Um, and you lose structural diversity when that happens and biodiversity, plant diversity that can support a nice diverse group of marsh birds as well. Um, we also want to do what we can to keep any mainland and island nesting sites free from human disturbance when possible. Um, and then continue monitoring existing colonies of black crown night herons because there are still a lot of information gaps. Um, a lot of information we don't know about where they're breeding necessarily. Um, there isn't like an annual census or that gets done for this particular species. So um, it's important to do what we can to continue monitoring existing colonies uh, like they're doing at Detroit Zoo. So now we're going to kind of cover black crown night heron identification and how to tell them apart from some similar species. Uh, this, we're also going to include a little ID quiz, so um, pay attention to some of these details and we can test your bird brain in a few more slides. Um, so black crown night herons, as, as you can see in this photo, they are very stocky and compact herons. Uh, they often tuck their neck into their bodies, which give them that humpbacked appearance. Um, so that's that little humpbacked appearance. And the adults have this black cap and back that contrasts with the white and pale gray belly and wings um, below. Um, and note also the adults have these red eyes. Um, we're going to look at different age groups too because the juveniles look quite different from the adults. So this is an adult in flight and just focusing on some of those, again, identifying characteristics. Um, even in flight, you can see the black cap and black back, which contrasts very nicely with the pale undersides and the gray wings. Um, and then you can also very clearly see that chunky bill um, that is very definitive of this species. So the juveniles, again, similar shape and size to the adult. They still are that thick necked heron with a really thick bill. Um, but the color of the bill is yellowish um, or pale uh, as opposed to dark like on the adults. And then overall, they're brown and streaky like a lot of other juvenile herons and other juvenile marsh birds uh, that you might come across so they can blend in with their surroundings. Uh, the heavy streaking on the neck is somewhat blurry, uh, which can help you differentiate this from another juvenile heron species that we'll go over in a second. Um, and they do have white spotting on the wings. Do note again the, the chunky bill that is going to help you separate this from other species and that stocky appearance over all of this bird. And here is that juvenile up close again have that blurry streaking around the neck, and then that bill, that chunky bill that has that pale yellow color to it on the lower mandible. Uh, so similar species, while not as common, uh, sometimes we are lucky enough to have some yellow crown night herons here in Michigan, um, and this is an adult, and they have darker gray underparts compared to the black crown night heron. And they're not as short and stocky in appearance. They are a little more elegant and elongated, though they still can tuck their neck in to their bodies. So um, don't rely on that. They can adjust how they look based on their, um, their body language and their behavior. 
Um, they do have that bold black and white or yellow head pattern as well, which is really their definitive feature on the adults that separates them from the black crown night heron. The juveniles are a little more difficult to tell apart. Um, they are also streaked all over and vary from gray to brown in color. Uh, so from, from afar, and as you can see here, this bird has tucked its head in to its body, so it can look quite a lot like a juvenile black crown night heron. Um, but one of the ways to tell them apart is looking at that bill color. Um, so the black crown night heron has yellowish tones to that bill, especially that lower mandible, and it's paler in color. Um, whereas a juvenile yellow crown night heron is going to have a very dark bill. Uh, the streaking that's around the neck as well is finer and not as blurry as the streaking on a black crown night heron juvenile. Inner streaking there. Another similar species that you can definitely find here throughout Michigan is the green heron. Uh, adults, while they have that dark cap on the head, um, which can sometimes make you think you might be seeing a black crown night heron, um, they are smaller overall, and they have this darker and more richly colored uh, plumage. So they have this beautiful reddish tone and greenish tone to their plumage, and this dark crown on their head in the right light is actually more green than black. Um, their bill is also thinner, uh, particularly at the base, um, than the black crown night heron bill. And then the juvenile green herons are also still smaller in a body size with that thinner bill. And while they're also streaky uh, and brown all over like the black crown night heron, they have more of a chestnut color to their, their neck, um, like the side and the back of their neck. So that's something to look out for uh, if you do come across some juvenile herons in a marsh. So we're going to test your bird brains. Um, we are going to share images on the left and right, and you can enter in the chat L and R um, for what you think the species are on the left and right. I will give you a few seconds to enter your response in the chat, what you think the left bird is and the right bird is. Um, feel free to include the age if you want. Um, of the bird and Emily will share with us um, what you all are guessing and then we'll review the answers. Some chats coming in. So we're seeing uh, a lot of that L is the green heron. Oh wow, you guys are moving fast. I see R is the yellow crowned heron, L is the green heron. Okay, great. Heron, what are you, where are we landing on this one? This, that all sounds great. So the left bird is indeed the green heron. This is an adult green heron. Uh, we can really tell um, that by that beautiful green coloration in the wing and on the cap. Um, and that reddish color as well along the side of the bird. Uh, the bill is also, compared to this bill, not as chunky. Um, so we can kind of eliminate yellow crown night heron and black crown night heron from the list. And the bird on the right is a yellow crown night heron juvenile. So good job to those that guessed that. Um, and the definitive feature again here is that chunky dark bill, so lacking any of that yellow pale coloration that we see in the black crown night heron juvenile and the more fine streaking um, on the back of the head and the neck. Great. So next we have some juvenile birds to compare against one another. Um, so please enter in the chat. L for left birds, R for right bird, um, what your guesses are. And we will go over these two different species as well. All right, we have some answers coming in. R, black crown night heron. See two of those. Okay. L, immature green heron. Our black crown night heron. Great. Excellent. 
L. Green Heron. Go ahead, Erin. All right, perfect. Yes, so you are all on the right track. That left trio of birds are juvenile or immature green herons, and the bird on the right is a juvenile black crown night heron. Um, so great work there. And as far as definitive features, uh, we are looking at those bills. Um, the bills here didn't really match what we had kind of gone over for black crown night heron, um, which has that pale yellow color, um, or the yellow crown night heron, which has a dark chunky bill. Um, and then these birds also have that more chestnut coloration or reddish coloration to their necks. Um, which is indicative of immature green herons. And then for that black crown night heron, we have that chunky look to it. Uh, its neck is tucked into its body, giving it that hunchback look, and it has that yellow colored chunky bill. Um, the streaking on the neck um, is also a little blurrier, um, and up here as well, blurry streaking, uh, which is indicative of black crown night herons. And then we have some adults to compare. Uh, you can put your guesses again in the chat, see what we've got here. L for the left bird, R for the right, and let us know what you think we've got here. Right, left, yellow, crown, right, black crown, we have left yellow crown, right black crown. Seems that that is a consensus. All right, great, great work, everyone. So yeah, we do have on the left, the yellow crown night heron, and on the right, an adult black crowned night heron. Um, and again, those defining features uh, separating these two include the chest color there. We've got a darker gray on the yellow crown night heron compared to the pale black crown night heron. Uh, chest and belly, and then that facial pattern of black and white or yellowish on that yellow crowned night heron, um, really setting it apart from the black crowned night heron, um, which has its black cap and black back that contrasts uh, very strongly against its pale underparts. So great work, everyone. We have a bonus round, and this is the final round of two juvenile species. Give us your best guesses. So I think you guys will nail it because you've been on, on top of it for each one. So well done. We have answers coming in, left green, right yellow. We have left black, right yellow. The right black. All right. So, yeah, these ones, because it's two juveniles back to back, a little more confusing. These are the two that are a little more similar to one another. Um, the one on the left is the black crowned night heron. Uh, we have that thicker, blurry, or streaking around the neck and throat, um, that pale yellow in the chunky bill, uh, and the white uh, spotting in the wing. And then on the right, we have the yellow crowned night heron, again with that chunky bill and spotting overall, but it has finer streaking around the, the neck and the color of that chunky bill is black. Um, so those are the, the big takeaways uh, with these two species. And that bill color is usually very reliable um, until the juvenile black crown night herons start to look more like their adult counterparts and <laughs> then their bill starts to change color um, as their eye changes color as well. So that happens later on in their life cycle. So well done, everybody. And with that, I'm gonna pass things back over to Matthew who's gonna share some information about the Detroit Zoo Colony. Thank you. Nice job, everybody, on those quiz. Those juveniles can be a little uh, tough, but you guys seem to have them down quick. So yeah, let's let's talk about the uh, colony here at the Detroit Zoo. Um, the birds just uh, started showing up at the zoo in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, there's a lot of good habitat here at the zoo. There's a couple lakes. 
and and some nice wetland and they they just showed up and and colonized a nice spot and started breeding and with that they've been here now for uh, over 20 years uh successfully breeding each summer uh the the colony was a little bit smaller when it first started but uh it's grown up to over uh, 50 breeding pairs and it's really interesting to watch how the colony continues to grow and uh, thrive. What's also interesting is uh, for a long time, the colony was kind of positioned uh, more towards the uh, back end or west end of the park by a large African yard. And, and primarily the colony was just high up in a couple honey locust trees. And there's a big pool in that yard, which I think helped draw them to this area. But over the uh, past few years, they've actually started to move around the park and break the colony up a bit. As far as last year, uh, we saw them breeding over um, a chunk of birds over the bald eagle yard, some over one of our uh, South America yards, and some even uh, bred in trees, I think in a few mulberry trees up by the lake in the front of the park. So it's fascinating to see how they uh, move around to where they think and want their resources to be. And I'm really curious to see where, where they're gonna be this year because they used to always be by that uh, one uh, larger pool, very condensed in the back. So we'll certainly take a look, uh, but time will tell. So uh, what do we do with the birds? Uh, our staff here, uh, we certainly monitor the colony. We see how they're doing. We do a lot of nest observations with it being so close. We can get a, a lot of good eyes on these birds and really learn uh, what all they're doing. Along with that, um, we like to ban the uh, juveniles. They're a little bit easier, especially uh, when we were talking about earlier, some that uh, right before they're flighted, if they come to the ground, it can be pretty easy to catch them or we'll, we'll still catch up some of the unbanded adults. And we will uh, put a couple different bands on them. On the right leg, they will get a, a metal band, which will be their federal band. And then on the left leg, we will put a colored band that has a letter and, and numbers, and that associates the distinct individual. And it'll also helps us uh, tell what year class it is in. And it really, uh, banding of birds really gives us uh, great information on them to, to understand their whole life cycle. By banding them, we're hoping that all you wonderful citizen scientists out there will, you know, help help get some information back to us because so we know where these guys breed so we can protect that habitat, but we don't necessarily know where all of them winter or where they stop during migration. And not only night herons, but with all of our bird species, as we try and protect them, we need to protect each part of their life cycle. We, you know, once we figure out the breeding grounds, we can protect that, but we need to protect where they're wintering. And then it's ever so important as these birds go through unbelievable migrations, stopover areas are, are vital, vital sources for them to rest and get nourished as they're making their journeys back, back and forth. Uh, but yes, yeah, so overall, we don't we don't have a ton of info on where these guys winter. I know a couple of them have been seen in years. There's a few uh, night herons that are seen regularly in some uh, wetland in Dearborn. But overall, uh, to help us figure out the puzzle. Let's see where these guys are going, because I bet a lot of them are going uh, pretty far south. And there, that picture, uh, this picture right here shows uh, the bands we were uh, talking about. You can see that a metal one and then the uh, nice uh, other tag. So uh, this is pretty cool. So during the quiz, you guys saw the yellow crown night here. And so it must have been, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, a yellow crown showed up with the colony, which is really unique. Uh, the, the yellow crown is a much more southern bird. They Their range does not extend into Michigan. I think they're year round in Florida, but a lot of them uh, just breed in the US and then head further south. But 
at any rate, this guy showed right up in the colony and started building a nest and he was displaying, but uh, he just couldn't get any takers. And, and the bird came back for, I don't know, th two or three years, maybe four years. And every year, a poor guy would be in the middle of the colony. He'd, he'd work on his nest, be a good looking nest and he'd display, but uh, never found a mate. So eventually uh, he stopped showing up. So I'm hoping he, I'm hoping he found a yellow crowned uh, uh, colony. So what do these guys eat? Uh, they they eat out, good out of the environment. They eat lots of fish out of the lakes. I've seen them pull some catfish out of it. Uh, lots of crayfish. They'll also forage in surrounding areas around the zoo. I've seen them regurgitate koi to the young birds, all kinds of stuff. And then they definitely like to be opportunistic and uh, steal the resident birds' foods. So we have all different kinds of fish and, and meat-eating birds at the, the zoo. For example, we have quite a few um, European white storks, which uh, is a much bigger bird than the night hare and pro probably two to three times the size of it in length and, and much and weighs a lot more than the night hare. And, and we'll... Uh, We'll hand toss food to the white storks in the yards, so, you know, fish and meat and whatnot. And the night herons will come right in. I've had night herons come and take a fish straight out of the white stork's mouth. I mean, they are very bold, but hey, when they got young to feed, they're they're gonna do whatever they need and and get that food to their to their young. So uh, if you guys uh, wanna come visit the colony here at the zoo, uh, they breed throughout spring and summer. Uh, I'm trying to think, I, I saw a few on uh, March 14th this year would have been the earliest sighting I had of them. And I saw a few birds flying up overhead and they landed at the wetland area on the lake in the front of the park. And uh, generally they'll stage around the two uh, larger natural lakes in the park at first for a few days. So I'd expect in the literal coming days, we'll really start to see those birds come in as we get some Southern winds. And that they'll initially stage there and then they're gonna get to work on their nests. So I'll be out there looking and I hope you guys will be too, but we'll, we'll see if they, they choose to go back to some of those honey locust trees that they have liked on an annual basis, or they, I wouldn't be surprised to see some of those birds go back to the eagle web, to the site over the eagle habitat, or one of the South America yards. And uh, if you're out there looking for them, you can certainly, you're looking for them. We're always listening with our ears as, a, you know, as you're looking for birds, your ears give you such a cue on where they are. And then the one other point that really stands out is you look for the messy white area on the ground. Whenever you got a rookery, yeah, you can generally smell it and they will paint it white. So we'll use all these indicators and together we'll see uh, where these guys are, are nesting this year. And, and usually they are at the zoo from generally mid-March. So they were right on point this year, just starting to show up. And then they're going to be nest building in the spring months and raising their chicks uh, throughout the summer. And then the adults will start to leave a, a bit in the earlier fall. And then we still see uh, some of the juveniles hanging around the colony uh, into November. And then generally they are out of town. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to pass it back to Aaron because even though we love them here at the zoo, you know, sometimes there are issues between uh, humans and wildlife and, and she'll let you know maybe what you should do if you don't exactly want them in your yard. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, and I, I agree completely that if they were here in my backyard, if I had a pond to entice them with, I would be really excited um, to have them here. But uh, not everybody feels that way, especially if they have a fish pond that they want to keep stocked um, throughout the year, as opposed to offering up some bird food. So if this becomes an issue within your community, uh, we just encourage you all to be an advocate for bird friendly deterrence. Um, so there are a few things you can do to help deter birds from 
eating out of your fish pond or if you don't want to have the noise and mess of a rookery on your property, um, ways you can deter them from nesting there as well. Um, this usually includes the installation of owl decoys or reflective pinwheels. Um, even tying balloons uh, to different parts of your, your property fences or branches and trees with faces uh, drawn on them can help deter birds. Um, but they are smart and these things usually uh, can get accustomed to by these birds. So it's a good idea to move them around if you do have any decoys or deterrents like this on your property um, every couple of weeks to help to keep the birds away. Um, if you do have one that has returned to continuously hunt at a pond or a neighbor has a bird that they're complaining about hunting in a pond, uh, motion activated sprinklers are a really good way to keep birds away if they keep returning to the same place. Um, it, you know, deters them enough as a an, small annoyance, but isn't going to harm them. Um, but something to keep in mind as well um, for black crowned night herons, but other migratory bird species is that they are federally protected. Um, so if nesting has begun, like you see in this photo here, um, there's nothing you can do um, or that anyone in your community could do to try to harass the birds or deter them at that point. You kind of have to wait until the breeding season is over. You have to wait until young have fledged the nest. Um, anything that could impact or change their behavior, cause some mobbing of you or others um, would be considered harassment. So um, just something to keep in mind uh, as nesting season begins for a lot of different bird species over the next month. Um, and a lot of maintenance also starts to kick in with, with different buildings and structures and yard work. So um, if you do come across a nest that's not in a great a location, you can refer to uh, Michigan DNR and to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for insight as to what to do about that particular bird. But hopefully most of you being here would be pretty excited like us about <laughs> some black crown night here <laughs> on your property. Um, so there are some other calls to action um, and how you can get involved to help protect black crown night herons here in Michigan and across the Great Lakes region. Um, so first is to submit any black crown night heron observations uh, through eBird. So uh, for those of you that don't know what eBird is, it's a free online um, and app, uh, mobile app that is a community science database. Um, and it's the, one of the largest databases in the world. Um, and you can use even breeding codes, um, not just your observation of, yes, I saw a black crown night heron, but you could also mark down if you're seeing a bird carrying nesting material, um, or if you've found a nest or seen a, a fledged juvenile, um, you can include that age and breeding information. Um, so that gives us a little added insight and the data is accessible to researchers and conservationists um, and other scientists that are interested in conserving this species. So it's a really great tool um, and it's a really great way for you all to get involved in uh, helping us monitor and fill some black crown night heron gaps. Um, also, like Matthew mentioned, they do have some banded black crown night herons out here in Michigan, um, thanks to the efforts at the Detroit Zoo. So if you happen to encounter one of these birds um, outside of zoo grounds, please submit those uh, observations to the USGS Bird Banding Lab, and they'll make their way back to the Detroit Zoo so they get the information about where you saw that bird. You can also visit the Detroit Zoo Colony this summer uh, if you're in Southeast Michigan or have an opportunity to travel out here uh, for a fun weekend. Um, it's a great opportunity to see them up close and see them nesting uh, and see all of that amazing activity. Uh, it's also a great idea to support local conservation organizations and wetlands conservation and restoration. Like we mentioned, that's one of the big conservation strategies for this species and other secretive marsh birds that have seen declines across the Great Lakes and here in Michigan. Uh, you can also support your local public lands and Michigan's wetland wonders. Uh, which are our managed waterfowl hunt areas, uh, many of which double as important bird areas and are home to black crowned night herons at some stage of their life cycle. Sometimes they're breeding there, sometimes they're having a pit stop on their southward or northward migration. Um, those are typically really great wetland areas for this species. 
Um, and then to receive updates on black crown night herons and other Michigan birds, you can follow the Detroit Zoo, My Birds, Audubon Great Lakes, and Michigan Department of Natural Resources on social media. So with that, I want to pass things over to Emily Osborne, and we will have some time for some Q&A. Thanks, Erin. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today for this presentation. We'll take some time now to answer some of the questions that you sent in through the chat uh, box. The first one is for Matthew. So you showed two chicks in a nest sitting in what looked like a bucket on one of your slides. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that photo where these rescued babies, perhaps? Sure. So those were, um, that was probably a day when we were banding a couple's uh, birds and it might have been a stormy night. So we talked about sometimes these chicks get out of the nest a touch early. And I think that was a couple birds that uh, were probably on the ground before they were perfectly flighted. So we're just going to give them a quick uh, health assessment, make sure they're fine, put their bands on. And then those guys were just released right there. And those two, I think, climbed back up and, and into a bush and ended up fledging within a couple of days. Awesome. Uh, speaking of banding, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, banding in regards to the lifespan of a black crown night heron? Do night herons just get banded once and the band stays on forever or do they need to be rebanded? Yep. So uh, generally with uh, these bands, they are meant to be on there for life. So the metal or federal bands are a really nice band that, that stays on there permanently. And uh, all banding is done by uh, individuals who are completely uh, certified and trained on how to band. So therefore, it's done in, in a way that is appropriate to the bird and doesn't hurt it at all. And yep, those metal and plastic bands are meant to uh, be on there for uh, for life. Sometimes over for birds that live quite a long time, some of the numbering can get a little bit washed or weathered over time, but uh, overall it does pretty well and it really helps us to assess when you recratch a bird that was banded 10 or 12 years ago, boom, you instantly have information that that bird's coming and going from this area for a decade. And I just wanted to add quickly too, yeah, that um, these bands do have unique identifiers on them. So um, the color bands as well allows the Detroit Zoo to know, even if you only manage to spot that color band, it's got a number on it that's specific to that individual. So they can track that um, just from reciting records, even if they don't manage to recapture the bird. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, this one's for Erin. Could you talk a little bit about the uh, black crown night heron uh, habitat needs, including wetlands. We had one question on the difference between wetlands and marshes. Um, we also have a really great article on this, which I can share in the chat, but I, I want to pass it over to you, Aaron, to, to share a little bit about. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Emily. Um, so yeah, the, the marshes and wetlands, um, they're kind of interchangeable terms. Um, so these are areas where uh, you're between kind of a body of water um, in, of some capacity and land, and it's that marshy in-between um, habitat where we have emergent vegetation mixed with some open water. And what we see with a lot of our secret marsh birds and water birds that rely on wetlands, um, including waterfowl, is that they really like what is called hemi marsh. Um, and that's where you have 50% emergent vegetation um, and 50% open water with a, a good amount of what we call interspersion um, between the two. So you wanna have a certain amount of patchiness um, in that habitat too for some diversity, uh, structural diversity. Um, and that provides some opportunities for cover as well as open water patches for foraging. Um, and, and that's really something that they're looking for. As far as water depth, I'd have to go back and, and review myself for what their preferences are. But with a lot of our secretive marsh birds, um, each species has kind of a different water depth preference. So with a lot of our coastal wetlands, um, we see water levels change uh, seasonally and also annually year to year. Um, so it can help accommodate a variety of, of species within the same wetland um, over time. So um, 
I think I answered all of those questions and hopefully the article that Emily shared in the chat can also give you a little more information about the benefits of what a hemi marsh is. Yep, that was great. Thanks, Erin. Um, Matthew, we have some questions on the sleeping habits of black crown night herons. Uh, where do they sleep and what does it look like? Do they lay down? Yep, that's, that's good. Uh, good question. It's always a weird how some birds sleep and, and what, how they sleep. Their, their, their patterns during breeding season are very off because they're uh, trying to raise chicks and keep them warm. So just like us when we're raising kids, they're certainly not getting as good of sleep uh, with those little night heron chicks. But uh, generally, they're going to roost up in a tree where they're safe from predators that might think of them as a nice meal if they're on the ground. And as you'll see with all kinds of different uh, shorebirds and or even flamingos or all kinds of species like that, they'll generally uh, just kind of be in a hunched position standing up and they can they can sleep on one leg or two legs and they also uh, if they're incubating we'll see them just sleeping on the nest and a lot of times if they're busy at night you'll see them just kind of relaxing or sleeping during the day up in the tree thanks matthew uh and thanks yeah. to everyone again for sending in their questions we have time for one more question uh, this is a fun one and I'm going to pass over to you, Matthew. Are there any other interesting birds of note that travel through the zoo? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the zoo has uh, some awesome natural habitat within it and we do, a, we do a great job of preserving different types of habitat within it. So uh, going back to eBird, we have recorded on it 149 species that have been seen uh, wild birds at the zoo. And it's a really great migration stopover. If uh, anybody's into uh, birding spring or fall migration, we get lots of different wood warblers and vireos that stop through in the first uh, few weeks of May. And beyond that, we also usually have a couple green herons, as you guys uh, saw them in the quiz. There's usually a couple green herons that will spend the summer at the zoo at one either one of the lakes. And we have um, tree swallows and barn swallows will come come back and breed on zoo grounds. And we, yeah, we really do get a good diverse uh, amount of species that uh, many species come just to uh, breed here in the summer, but uh, lots of them use it as a stopover. We're in a fairly urban area. And I, I've looked before on like a satellite view of the map and there aren't a ton of really big green spaces here. You know, there's a lot of urbanization. So, so what, I, what I believe is a lot of these birds see it as a great stopover point during migration. So definitely during the months of May and April and then throughout the fall, you'll also see a lot of migrants. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, I'm going to now pass things back over to Erin. She's going to wrap up the webinar with the webinar and talk about how to stay in touch with us. Great. Thanks, Emily. And thanks, Matthew. Um, I wanted to add as well that the zoo has done some really great work to make their uh, campus very bird friendly as well. So during migration, since there are so many amazing birds that fly through and visit the zoo, um, they've made efforts to prevent bird building collisions on campus. And there's information there about um, how you can get involved and do something similar to your own home and workspaces there at the zoo. Um, so just wanted to thank you all um, and have uh, an opportunity to see. I'm actually wondering if the stay in touch slide is here, Emily. It's not. So um, if you want to just stay in touch with us uh, on social media, again, follow My Birds Detroit Zoo and Audubon Great Lakes. Um, we would greatly appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming webinar. We have one uh, next week, uh, same uh, Wednesday, Wednesday at noon um, Eastern on the Kirtland's Warbler. Um, so we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you everyone very much, and have a great rest of your day.